In particular, it was the Gospel of John that led me to the Lord. And as many know, a lot of adult conversions occur through people reading this Gospel. Now, if you would have asked me, um, what did I think of Adam back then? Well, I would have agreed, like most people, that Adam was a real historical person. However, many of you must be asking right now, what happened? And simply stated, I started to reevaluate my techniques in reading the scriptures. One notion of reading the scriptures that I started to reevaluate was scientific concordism. And let me give you a couple definitions. Scientific concordism is the assumption that God revealed scientific facts in the Bible thousands of years before their discovery by modern science. Or another way of defining scientific concordism, it is the assumption that the facts of science align with the Bible. Now, are these reasonable assumptions? Oh, they certainly are. Think about it. God is the creator of the world. God is also the author and inspirer of his word, the Bible. You would think that the two would align. However, I started asking the question, but is it true? Is scientific concordism actually a feature in the Bible? And I'll answer the question with simply one diagram. I don't think scientific concordism is true because the Bible has a three-tier universe in it. We don't have to go very far into the scripture. Second day of creation in the first chapter of the Bible states that God created a firmament, a hard, firm surface to lift the waters above from waters below. Now, of course, this it's rather shocking to 21st century minds, but the key of reading scripture is to respect it and to respect the words. And in fact, the word firmament, Hebrew rakia, that's exactly what that word means, a hard, firm surface. Now, why would they have thought that? Well, put yourself back in the ancient world and you look up and what do you see? A great big blue dome. That's not such a bad idea to suggest there's a sea of water overhead. And that's exactly what they believed. In fact, the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, all ancient Near Eastern peoples, believed this was the case. And if we go to the fourth day of creation, what does God do? He places the sun, the moon, and the stars. Where? In the firmament. Isn't that what it looks like? These heavenly bodies right in front of that great big blue dome makes perfect sense from an ancient understanding of the physical world. In the light of the three-tier universe, we can now make sense of a couple biblical passages. For example, earlier in the presentation, we saw Acts 4.12, which states that there's no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. The notion of being under heaven reflects a three-tier universe. Philippians 2 verses 10 to 11 is a very popular passage. Uh, most of us sing this in our churches in our praise and worship. And it goes like this. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in heaven, on earth. And of course, most of us want to say under the earth, but the actual Greek is in the underworld. In other words, there's a three-tier universe. So what this passage, using an ancient understanding of the physical world, is saying is that Jesus is Lord of the entire universe as they understood the universe, that is, the ancient peoples. You will notice that the earth is like an island. It's surrounded by water. Why would people 
in the ancient Near East believed this was the case? And the way to answer this is you have to think like an ancient. Think about the regional geography. Ancient peoples would have traveled in all directions. And what would they have come to? They would eventually come to a body of water. So from their perspective, to suggest that they were surrounded by a circumferential sea made perfect sense from their ancient perspective. And of course, this is where we get the phrase, the ends of the earth, or in other words, the shoreline where the circumferential sea meets this island-like earth. In fact, this ancient notion is found in the scriptures. In Isaiah 41, God calls Abraham from Ur, which is at the very ends of the earth, and calls him to the promised land to establish the Hebrew peoples. Jesus himself, in Matthew 12, says the Queen of Sheba came from the very ends of the earth to visit Solomon in Israel. In other words, Jesus uses the science of the day. So what do we make of the three-tier universe? Well, the first thing to point out is this is an ancient phenomenological perspective. And on your handout, on the first page at the top of the right-hand column, I've defined this. This is nature as it appears to the natural senses. For example, the naked eye. And this word phenomenological is just the Greek term phenomai, which means to appear. What the ancients saw, they believed was actual. This is their universe. So what we're seeing here within the scripture, God using an ancient phenomenological perspective to describe the world. It's important to point out that this was the best science of the day. It was not only the Hebrew peoples who accepted this, but all ancient peoples in the ancient Near East. To be more precise, the three-tier universe is ancient science. And if we would have lived back at that time, this is exactly what we would believe. The presence of a three-tier universe in the Word of God brings us back to that question I asked at the beginning of this section on biblical interpretation. Is scientific concordism true? And I think everyone knows the answer. No, it's not. What we find in the scriptures is an ancient understanding of the physical world. In other words, statements about nature in the scriptures do not align with the scientific facts that we know today. Of course, some of you will be very quick to ask, you know, did God lie in the Bible? And here's my answer. No, absolutely not. God does 